It's a good Shabbat today, beautiful summer Shabbat. Um, we're still sort of in our uh, post-camp season, and um, for a little bit of time, I like to keep, keep processing, discussing camp. Actually, next week, we're going to have some of our counselors and people share a bit more experiences. Um, but um, uh, last week, in light of the Shema being in our Parsha, I brought together several camp discussions. It was actually like four camp discussions into one kind of message. And um, this summer, the, our, our theme was the Shema, beloved of our soul. And I had an idea this week that um, if I could do the same with the second part of our curriculum, we won't get everything, of course, but just some other ideas, then we could actually send this out to the camp families and kind of have like a summary of um, different ideas. And uh, I thought that would be neat. And, and also, I think this is a topic that is very relevant to us now um, and to our this coming year. You know, we've got a year of um, all kinds of things happening in the world around us, and I think this will be very helpful. Our picture last week, big picture, was that the Shema is a love story. Uh, God desires us to love Him with everything that we have to cherish, to treasure his words as we might a love letter of a, of a beloved. And we saw how Yeshua is the heart of the Shema and how we must keep his words and keep him on our hearts. Like if you remember from last week or from camp, the Midrash that we shared where uh, the words are just above our hearts so that when our hearts are open, he might fall in. Uh, now, once we find the beloved of our soul, we find that loving God is inseparable with loving each other well. And that's what we want to talk about today. In Mark 12, uh, Yeshua highlights this. A Torah scholar asks Yeshua, what is the commandment that is first of all, the most important commandment? And Yeshua answers, the first is, and he says, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Eloheinu, Hashem Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind and all of your strength. And the second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these, Yeshua says. Similarly, in some years before Yeshua's day, when he was here with us in person, in the first century BCE, we see this discussion happening in Judaism as well. Uh, a non-Jew wants to convert to Judaism, so he goes to the Shammai school of Pharisees and says, what do I need to do to convert to Judaism standing on one foot? And Shammai takes a rod and beats him out of the synagogue. Uh, the same man goes to Hillel school of Pharisees and asks the same question. And Hillel responds, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. That is the entire Torah. The rest is just commentary. Now go and study. Just after Yeshua's day, Rabbi Akiva of the first and second century carries Yeshua's teaching on into rabbinic Judaism. He says, this is the greatest principle of the Torah. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The Baal Shem Tov of the 17th century, who founded the Hasidic Jewish movement, said a soul enters this world for 70, 80 years just to do a favor for another. So let's take a look at 19, Leviticus 19, 18. Let's dive into this passage where we find love your neighbor as yourself. I think that loving your neighbor as yourself, it's something that we hear so often that it sort of loses its meaning. Love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, we say it all the time, the golden rule. What does it actually mean to love your neighbor as yourself in the Torah? What is the Torah getting at? Why is this commandment to love your neighbor uh, so important when it's just one line out of, in the midst of, of, of hundreds of other commandments in Leviticus and even in the same chapter? It's just one line. Why is it so important? Why is this one line so important? Let's see if we can make it less abstract and see if we can learn what the Torah means by unpacking the context of this verse. So in verse 17, we'll begin, Leviticus 19, 17. You are not to hate your brother in your heart. You are to firmly rebuke your neighbor. Do not bear sin because of him. Do not take revenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
So let's break this down into four different parts. We have uh, first, don't hate your brother in your heart. We have rebuke or confront your brother. Don't bear sin upon yourself. We have do not take revenge. Don't hold a grudge. And then love your neighbor as yourself. So what if we take these and break them apart and then bring them back together and see if it informs what love your neighbor as yourself means according to the Torah. So let's look first at do not hate your brother in your heart. Achicha is brother. It doesn't just mean brother. It could mean kinsman. It could mean your people. It could mean your neighbor. Uh, the Torah could simply say, do not hate your brother. And I think that would make a lot of sense. Listen, don't hate your brother. Don't do hateful things to your brother. It could say that. But instead it adds this interesting phrase, do not hate your brother in your heart. And so the great rabbinical commentators have asked this question, why does the Torah emphasize in your heart? And uh, Rambam answers this question, because it is the way of those who hate to cover up their hatred in their hearts. Just as it is said in Proverbs 26, 24, an enemy conceals with his speech, yet in his heart he harbors deceit. So people might think, uh, it's fine if I hate my brother so long as I don't show it. Maybe you've thought this too. It's fine if I hate him. I just don't show it. It's fine. But the reality is, it always comes out. You can't manage hatred on the inside. It doesn't stay there. It will come out. And then what happens is that hatred burns a hole in our souls. So we know this famous quote by uh, Shlomo Karbach. He was asked why he would play in Germany right after the Holocaust. Don't you hate the Nazis? And Karbach said, if I have two souls, I devote one to hating, but I only have one, so I won't waste it on hating. I wonder if we can connect this phrase do not hate your brother in your heart to the similar phrase in the Shema. These words shall be upon your heart. Uh, remember last week, we unpacked that the Shema is about accepting with our mind the yoke of heaven, and then we must love. And then that love must be realized or concretized in the world through actions that we do in the world. We left to concretize love in action. And then that phrase, on your heart, is this link between love and action. It's the place where our understanding and our desires are conceived into action. So the heart is where we cherish. It's where we treasure. It's where we become attached. So if you remember this Midrash, the words of Torah must be just above our hearts because when our hearts are closed, they can't get in. But then every so often our hearts will open and then the words will fall in. So what happens if we look at this verse, do not hate your brother in your heart through this lens? You will cherish, you will treasure, you will grow deeply attached to the things that you place on your heart because they will fall in. If you hate your brother in your heart, hate will fall in. Hate will be what you treasure. It will be what you nurse inside. It will be what you begin to cherish and grow to actually love. So rather than love, being conceived into action, hate is then conceived into action, hateful action. Rather than treasure your brother, you will grow to despise your brother. Let's go to our next verse. Rebuke your brother. Okay, this is really interesting. So let's think about how this verse, rebuke your brother, connects with the verse before. Do not hate your brother in your heart. Do not hate your brother in your heart. Rebuke your brother. So in real life, uh, there will be conflict. And I think the Torah acknowledges this. We are going to do the wrong thing. We're going to hurt other people. Just be in community. That's why we're in community, to deal with these things, because we hurt each other. People hurt us. People wrong us. We wrong other people. How can we possibly not come to hate our brother or our sister in our hearts? It's just too hard, we might say. Well, the Torah answers this for us. Confront your brother when you have a problem. Now, the word confront, hokeach, can mean a few different things. Um, it can mean reason together. It can mean talk. It can mean listen. It can mean uh, correct. It can mean reprove. It can mean rebuke. Uh, and it's, it's interesting. In this particular phrase, the word is actually written twice. It's repeated, hokeach, tokiach, and it's repeated twice. And in Hebrew grammar, what that does is it usually adds strength to it, and that's why like in the TLV, they translate this firmly rebuke. But thinking midrashically, 
Perhaps one way of looking at this repetition is more um, that it's progressive. First talk and listen and reason together and find the right way. And then if that doesn't work, then move with a more firm rebuke. Uh, now, the second half of this verse is really interesting. Confront your brother, but do not bear sin upon yourself. So don't hate your brother in your heart. Instead, confront, reason together. If that doesn't work, try again. But don't bear sin upon yourself. What does this mean? What is this sin that we're concerned about? Rambam asked the same question, a uh, rabbinical commentator. He, he understands this as a commandment, actually, that we must correct our brother when they're wrong. Um, if, if we do not confront our brother or our sister, but we hold hatred in our hearts, then what happens is, he says, we bear that person's sin upon ourselves because we failed to do our part to make it right. So the idea is that we have an obligation to initiate a conversation. And if we don't, we actually bear that person's sin against us as if it were our own sin. This is what he shares. Now, Rashi sees this in a different direction. He says, this means that when you rebuke or confront someone that you're angry with, do not shame the person. He uses the word that means to literally make their face go pale. Uh, don't shame them by doing so in public. Don't shame them by condemning the other person. I think both of these two ideas actually go together. Rashi agrees with Yeshua. In Matthew 18, 15, Yeshua tells us, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault while you're with him alone. If he listens to you, you'll have won your brother. In our, our parenting program, we teach this to kids in a very simple way, but I think it's really good for adults. Um, use your words without being mean. And in the context of marriage, uh, Rain and I have a conversation tool that we call the gentle confrontation. Bergashit Rabbah is a madrashic, uh, um, midrashic, excuse me, commentary written around the 4th century. And what we find is a commentary that brings in Leviticus 18, this verse. It says, this is a great principle of the Torah. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So one might say, if I am scorned, I should scorn back. If I have been cursed, I should curse back. But this is not so, Bereshit Rabbah says. And another sage comments, if you act this way, you must realize who it is that you are willing to humiliate, the one who was made in the likeness of God. Do you see the idea? The idea is that love requires that you work things out and make things right. You just can't hate your brother inwardly while covering it up on the outside. But when you do this, you need to do it without shaming the other person. Why? Because he too is made in the image of God. And Yeshua emphasizes this reading of these verses when he teaches in the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering upon the altar and you remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your offering there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and present your offering. So why is reconciling with your brother more important than worship? Because your brother is made in the image of God. It's the same teaching. And this brings up an interesting idea that Rabbi Jonathan Sachs speaks about in his commentary on these verses. He challenges the extreme idea from the hippie movement, all you need is love. You know the song, all you need is love, where boundaries are just removed from relationships. Instead, he argues that warm, fuzzy love feelings is not enough. Relationships also need rules. And perhaps this is why love your neighbor does not stand alone in the Torah, but it's this small verse nestled within all kinds of other laws about holiness, such as, you know, leave the corners of your field for the poor. Don't steal. Use just measures and weights. All kinds of restrictions around um, sexual relationships that are not permitted and can cause chaos. The Parsha even gives rules around identity, like not wearing priestly garments when you're not a priest. The Torah is creating boundaries that translate love to one another in actions. Rabbi Sachs writes, this is what Parsha Kedoshim, that's the Parsha where this verse is found, is all about. Clear rules that create social order. This is where real love, not the sentimental self-deceiving substitute, belongs. This is all that protects us from chaos. 
So the Torah's instruction is that we must confront someone who has violated these rules, but we must do so in the right way. This tells us a lot about what love your neighbor means. And going on, when you, when you try to talk with people about these things, with a person, and you confront a person, there are a few things that might happen. Um, the person might say, hey, I didn't mean that. Here's what I meant. And I think maybe 90% of conflicts are actually resolved through listening. Conversation leads to understanding, as Diane Cohen likes to say. A second, you might realize that maybe you don't really have a case at all. Um, you need to drop your charges. Okay. Uh, you might realize that you were really the one at fault. You might need to apologize. All of these things are what Yeshua says. If he listens to you, you will have won your brother. But the Torah also recognizes that it might not go so well. Maybe a person will just continue to accuse you. Maybe the person will deny it. Maybe the person will say, I don't care that I hurt you. Okay. Either way, love requires that we initiate the conversation. And then our verses in Leviticus tell us what to do next if it doesn't go well or what not to do next. The next verse here, do not take revenge and do not hold a grudge. You see, so either way, no matter what happens, even if it doesn't go well, you have to let it go. You have to let it go. Um, now, revenge and holding a grudge, they're two different words. What are the difference? What's the difference between revenge and nursing a grudge? Nursing a grudge is hating within one's heart, and it leads to these hateful actions that then become revenge. So they go together. And Rashi sees revenge and holding a grudge as opposite forms of hatred. So he uses this example. I love this example. Uh, one man asks the farmer, lend me your sickle. The farmer with the sickle says, no. The next day, the farmer asks the same man whom he refused, may I borrow your ax? Okay, now if the man says, no, I'm not going to give you my axe because you didn't lend me your sickle. This is taking revenge. You see? However, if the man says, sure, here it is. I'm not like you because you wouldn't lend it to me. This is called holding a grudge. You see? Why? Because he holds contempt and he holds hatred in his heart, uh, you know, even though he didn't avenge himself. So what's the solution according to our verses in Leviticus? The man needs to confront the farmer. First, with a gentle conversation. Listen, I'm happy to lend you my axe, and I will, but I need to let you know that I'm feeling upset that you didn't lend me your sickle yesterday. Perhaps the farmer will say, I couldn't lend it because it was broken. Or maybe I had already lent it. Or I had an urgent job that I needed to do. Then you've resolved your conflict, and like Yeshua says, you've won over your brother. Now, at rare times, you won't be able to resolve a conflict and Yeshua speaks to this in Matthew 18. I think this is pulling from Leviticus. He says, but if he does not listen, take with you one or two more, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may stand. But if he still refuses to listen, then bring it to Messiah's community. And if he refuses to listen even to Messiah's community, let him be to you like a pagan and a tax collector. Those are hard words. Let's see if we can unpack them a bit. The idea here is that you try your hardest one-on-one. -on -one. Perhaps, um, you know, one time gently, a second time with a bit more firmness, like we talked about. Rabbinic Judaism actually adds that you should try to reconcile at least three times, and then you bring in other people, seven other people, is the idea. But if this doesn't work, then involve others to help. If this still doesn't work, go to the next step, to the community, to get wisdom, to get help. And if this still doesn't work, Yeshua does not mean treat people with contempt like you would a tax collector. That's not what he means. I think he means simply treat the person with appropriate distance and boundaries, not as an intimate inside of your community. There has to be boundaries. There has to be space. So looking back uh, to these steps, when we, when we teach this to kids in the parenting program or parents to teach the kids, there are three weapons that we use to overcome conflict based on these principles we've been talking about in the Torah. Each weapon, though, has a hidden dagger that must be handled carefully. The first one is overlook an insult without becoming bitter. So if you can, you just let it go without becoming bitter. The second, we talked about use your words without becoming mean. And if that doesn't work, get help, but without complaining. Because once you add complaining in, then you're nursing a grudge. You see? So these are true for all of us, aren't they? A very simple way of putting this together. But either way, we must never nurse a grudge or take revenge. We must never hate our brother in our hearts. Now, the passage then concludes, love your neighbor as yourself. 
So if we put it all together in context, the verses above describe what it means to love your neighbor. The Torah assumes that people are going to do the wrong thing, that you're going to get mad, that you're going to get hurt, that you'll hate this person for doing this thing. If that happens, don't hate your brother in your heart. It will consume you. Instead, this is what you do. You talk with that person who has wronged you. You show them where they are, have wronged you, and you listen. You try these different ways before you set boundaries. And you have an obligation to do this, but make sure that you do it in a way that doesn't shame the person. And no matter what, even if you need to set boundaries and set distance, don't nurse a grudge inside or become bitter or take revenge. So according to Leviticus, this is what it means to love your neighbor as yourself, or at least one important component of it. See, love is not simply this feeling or a sentiment towards a person. Love assumes that there will be problems, things that you'll need to work out through relationships, and love requires that we work them out together. That's what love requires. And this is love of one's neighbor. It means to do right by your brother and sister according to the many commandments of love in the Torah. Now, later in Leviticus, the Torah expands loving your neighbor, telling us also to love the stranger in the same way. And this is how we can love the stranger. It's not about feelings. It's about doing right by them. Then what happens is Yeshua takes this love and he expands it even further. It's beautiful. He says, love your neighbor. Who is your neighbor? The Samaritan, the one you consider an outsider. And then even more, don't just love your neighbor, love even your enemies. Love even those who are persecuting you. And now this is critical because you don't need to have warm, fuzzy feelings about your enemy to love your enemy. It means that we apply the laws of Torah to our enemies just as we do to our brothers and sisters, that we do right by our enemies, that we don't take revenge, that we don't harbor a grudge, that we treat our enemies fairly. And I'll close with just one more point. Uh, not only does Yeshua expand the circle of whom we must love, but I think Yeshua expands the nature of love itself. In John, Yeshua says, if you, I give you a new commandment, John 13, 34, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, so also you must love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Why, why does Yeshua say a new commandment? Yeshua just quoted Leviticus when he said that the Torah is summed up in the Shema, love God with everything you have, love your neighbor as yourself. Why is this a new commandment? What's new? What's new is that Yeshua is asking us to expand love, to follow his example of love in the world. How has Yeshua loved us? The answer lies in the following verses after he makes this statement to his disciples. What does he do next in John 13 and 14? He washes his disciples' feet. You see? And this is symbolic of feet, the, the, the part you don't want to go near. He washes their feet. Yeshua loves the unlovable. He's, he's asking us to love the unlovable. He makes himself vulnerable. He serves by giving of himself. And then he goes willingly to the Garden of Gethsemane to be betrayed by one of his closest friends, and he takes the hit for love. He goes through so much pain to give of his life for love. And then even in his moment of desperation, he says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Yeshua loves through extreme forgiveness, radical forgiveness. And so perhaps what is new is that we're called to carry love all the way to the end, to go beyond what would be expected with love. You know, here's what's expected. Go beyond what's expected. Love all the way through. Um, Richard and Sabina Wormwood, have you heard of these? We talked about them before. Survived the Holocaust and the Soviet occupation in communist Romania following the war. Um, and I'll just share a short uh, story that they shared here. At camp, we actually shared a much larger story, which is beautiful. Um, but just by context, they were born as Orthodox Jews. They both became followers of Yeshua before the war. Um, and they modeled Yeshua's new radical love. Sabina lost her entire Jewish family in the German concentration camps. And in 1944, uh, Russia invaded Romania with one million troops. Romania uh, first fought with Germany against Stalin, but then it switched sides and joined with Russia and defeated the German occupying armies. 
And Richard and Sabina, through this whole time, used their home to shelter both Russian and German soldiers, sometimes at the same time, who were fleeing. Uh, the Germans were fleeing Russia at that time. And, and these were the same German soldiers who had killed Sabina's family. Um, one captain actually said to Richard, I don't know why you're doing this. You're Jewish. I hate Jews. We would have killed you. And even when Germany wins, we'll still kill you. And Richard said, even so, when you come under my roof, you will be loved. And one night after midnight, the actual man who was responsible for the deaths of Sabina's family, for ordering these deaths, showed up at their door, and he was crying. And Sabina got out of bed, embraced him, told him that she forgave him, and set up a fancy dinner for him in the middle of the night. And the next morning, he gave his life to Yeshua. This is Yeshua's radical love in extreme circumstances. It goes beyond what's expected. And Richard and Sabina both end up in prison. He's in solitary confinement for eight years. Uh, and there's many more stories until he's released of how he really did model this. Let me just summarize here as we close our verse, love your neighbor as yourself in Leviticus 19. Um, by, by going back to these tools we talked about in this uh, parenting program because they're so good, tools for conflict. Um, they highlight beautifully what Leviticus 19 is all about. And then there's a secret weapon for conflict that I didn't mention. So the first tools are overlook the insult if you can without becoming bitter. Use your words without being mean. If that doesn't work, get help without complaining about the other person. Now this is love. Have a conversation. Reconcile. You must never hate your brother in your heart no matter what you do. You must do right by your brother. Keep Torah in our relationships. But then when these things no longer work and we develop enemies in the world, which will happen, then we're given Yeshua's instructions to love as he has loved, to turn the other cheek, to walk the extra mile, to forgive the unforgivable, to pray for those who have wronged us. And then when this is required, what we do is we look to the blessing given to those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness. And that's our next secret weapon. Even here, it doesn't mean there's no boundaries. Yeshua modeled a lot of boundaries. But it means that somehow we go beyond what is expected as followers of Yeshua. Even when we need to give deeply of ourselves to do so, to love with Yeshua's new love. And Shabbat Shalom, everyone.